So if you love coffee or tea and are concerned about the impact of caffeine or the drink itself on your bones, this video is for you. This video has been a long time in coming and we have had hundreds, literally hundreds of requests to do the research that went into the creation of this content. I personally have resisted because I love coffee. And if given the choice, I will not ask questions that I do not want to know the answer to. Hmm. I asked my team to look into that research without the negative impact of my own personal bias. I didn't tell them that thought. And I promise that I will review this with as much objectivity as I can. And we'll see at the end if I'm convinced that I should either give up coffee or switch to decaf. So I'm curious, if you love coffee too, tell us on YouTube what your favorite brand is and why. I think this will be really interesting. So to review this topic, I wanted to look at all of the different potential avenues of investigating the relationship of coffee, tea, and caffeine with bone health. There is good evidence to support a position, but there's also some controversy. So let me walk you through the evidence so that you can make a decision around coffee, tea, and caffeine overall. So the big question here is, why is the fear? Why are we so worried about coffee and tea if we've been consuming these things for hundreds, maybe thousands of years? Well, the concern comes from studies like this. So this first study I pulled was a 2014 literature review and meta-analysis looking at studies that included over 253,000 participants and identified 13,000 fractures. So pretty big study. What they found is that there was a relative risk of fracture that was 14% higher than those that had the highest level of coffee consumption. And this was statistically significant, what you would expect from such a big study. But it was only true in women. In men, there was a 24% reduction in risk that was also statistically significant. So they demonstrated there was a dose response that was demonstrating increased risk in women, but not in men. So I agree, concerning association there, but explain to me the physiologic difference between men and women that would explain why it would be protective in men and risky in women. So that's a big red flag for me, but don't worry, we've got lots of evidence to go through. So let's move on here. So this next study is a 2006 study on over 31,000 women only, and they used a food frequency questionnaire, which food frequency questionnaires are notoriously inaccurate. But with coffee, I'm a little more interested in them because people are pretty consistent in their caffeine intake. So I bet actually a food frequency questionnaire is more consistent with coffee and caffeine than it would be with say like how many eggs you eat a week. What they did is they broke down the associations of different quintiles of caffeine. The highest quintile was up over 330 milligrams per day and the lowest was less than 200 milligrams per day. What they noticed is that the highest group had a 20% increased risk of fracture compared to the lowest quintile group. Now that significance was only noted for coffee and not tea, and we'll see that pop up more than once. They also looked at a subgroup analysis and revealed that the risk was confined to women who were consuming over four cups a day and less than 700 milligrams of calcium a day. The risk increased for those that were also at higher fracture risk overall. They had previous fractures. So if you take at-risk individuals that aren't consuming enough calcium and a lot of coffee, then maybe there is an issue here. Now, a couple of issues with this study. So one is, Again, I mentioned food frequency questionnaires are notoriously inaccurate. The accuracy of their calcium representation is certainly in question here, but it's not the only time we'll see this association. So big takeaway here for me is, okay, maybe more is worse. Maybe there's a, an association with calcium. So let's keep going. This 2006 rodent study that I pulled showed that caffeine can result in osteoblast death. Now, again, this is like in a Petri dish and you're basically like pouring caffeine on osteoblasts. So not sure how that really works out in the body, but maybe there's a mechanism here that we could say, meh, osteoblasts die when they're exposed to high levels of caffeine, maybe. So then one more in this line of, of thinking. So this 2001 study looked at caffeine intake specifically compared it to bone mineral density loss in a genotype of this thing called a VDR receptor. So what's a VDR receptor? So a VDR receptor is a vitamin D receptor. So this is the receptor that's inside the cell that vitamin D interacts with that requires vitamin A, by the way. And there are certain genes around the function of the VDR receptor. So they were able to actually look at 489, again, they called them elderly women from age 65 to 77, that might offend some people, but 489 elderly women 
with high caffeine consumption, so over 300 milligrams of caffeine, that's about 18 ounces of coffee for those that uh, don't measure their caffeine uh, like that, but about 18 ounces of coffee and they lost bone in the spine faster than those in the low group, which was less than 300 milligrams of caffeine, which is a lot of coffee, by the way. But the VDR genotype also played a role. So their conclusion is that genetics and high consumption of caffeine may result in faster bone loss. So you start to stack all those things together and you say, man, that sounds pretty bad for coffee and caffeine. Maybe I shouldn't be consuming caffeine. But ha. I'm not giving up my coffee that easily. So let me talk to you about the other side of the coin here, which is studies that support coffee, caffeine, and tea for bone mineral density. Before we get there though, if you're having a hard time putting all this together, consider joining us for our masterclass. Our masterclass is an hour long sit down on Zoom where I go through all the tools that we use to help build out custom programs. And then we leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end. Thousands of people have found this to be remarkably helpful. So if you haven't done this yet, look for the description on the link in YouTube, or if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to optimalhumanhealth.com and look for a link there. All right, so we ended the negative side with a genetic study. So here is a genetic study on the positive side. This is a little bit of a different study though, but this is a recent study using uh, one of these cool things called a Mendelian randomization study. All right, so what they did was they looked at the genetically determined caffeine and coffee intake and their impact on total bone mineral density and ultimately fracture, which of course is what we care about. And I won't get into the details of how this works, but let's just say this is kind of a, a newer strategy in looking at genetics uh, and we can really glean a lot of information uh, from this type of study, but again, it's not really an intervention study. So what they noted is that caffeine intake from both tea and coffee had an overall positive correlation with total bone marrow density. Let's say that again, caffeine intake was positive. The genetically determined caffeine intake from tea was also inversely associated with fracture, but this is tea, not coffee. So now we're talking about the type of uh, drink that you're consuming, so that could potentially be tea, and tea was inversely associated with fracture, meaning that more tea, less fracture or vice versa, if that makes sense. The big picture here is that it appears that the genetically determined caffeine intake from both tea and coffee may be beneficial to bone. And while we use genetics in our practice, we always have to remember that genetics are only the building blocks. And how we use our genetics is based off of our lifestyle and many, many inputs. And this is called the practice of epigenetics. So we have to look at real evidence, studies, association, prospective, whatever we can get to really determine what the impact is in real life on caffeine, coffee, and tea on specifically fracture risk, but bone mineral density as well. So this next study is a 2024 study through the NHANES database. Now this is a massive database, this big cohort, uh, and they were looking at a sub, uh, subset of 9,000 participants. They consider them middle and eight, middle-aged and older. And the summary was that moderate habitual coffee intake of less than two or equal to two cups of coffee per day would have a protective effect against osteoporosis and osteopenia, specifically of the femoral neck and spine. Um, and they defined, again, this age group as being over the age of 50. So now this study, of course, is an association study, and they use dietary recall questionnaires like the food frequency questionnaire. So this is definitely not perfect. But when it comes to coffee, Again, people are very habitual around their use, so a food frequency questionnaire in Haynes data might actually be worth looking at. Also remember that the association side of this should be used only to create a hypothesis and not to create recommendations. But my hypothesis, potentially biased, is that caffeine either from tea or coffee is not going to negatively impact my bone health. But let's continue through these studies because we've already showed four studies that show it could be harmful. This is only one study that showed that it could be helpful. So this next study is another observational study, but this is a 2023 meta-analysis of 20 studies looking at over 500,000 individuals to investigate coffee and tea and their impact on bone marrow density and, and fracture risk. The result here was that daily coffee or tea consumption was not associated with loss of bone marrow density or hip fracture risk at all. There does not appear to be any protective role in this study, but when it comes to my coffee and caffeine, I'll take a neutral result. I don't care that it's protective, I just don't want it to hurt my bones. This next study is a bit of a mixed bag. So it's a 2022 large meta-analysis, again, of observational studies. This is kind of what we have to do with nutrition. But observational studies looking at over 400,000 individuals and their bone mineral density and fracture incidents. This was an international publication. So this is kind of interesting where we're starting to look at different ethnicities, different populations, 
And what they noticed here is that there was an increased risk of fracture with increased consumption of coffee. But you can see, and I'll point this picture out here, this is a figure from the study. In the figure, there it does start to go up. It initially goes down, actually, it's protected, but then it starts to go up. And if you look at the numbers here on the bottom, you can see that when it starts to go up and it crosses one, which is where it becomes significant, you can see that that's nine or 10 cups of coffee a day. That's a lot of coffee. Additionally, if you read all the details here, you can get a sense that when you adjust for other variables, that significance goes away. So what we could take away from this is it might be that people that are consuming like 10 cups of coffee are potentially engaging in other activities that might be bad for their bones. I can only think of somebody sitting there sipping coffee and smoking cigarettes. But the, also the ethnic consideration here is that the association appears to be stronger in Asia than it does to be in Europe and America. And again, the association goes away when you adjust for other variables. So overall, as long as one is consuming less than nine cups of coffee a day, then there doesn't appear to be any increased risk. So you might be asking yourself, well, what about tea alone? What if I don't like coffee and I only drink tea? Okay, there is actually a study looking at that. So there's actually a meta-analysis with 17 articles talking about tea alone. And what it looks like is that tea alone is actually protective of osteoporosis in all subgroups. So again, tea probably outperforms coffee. Now, these next two studies are both large longitudinal studies looking specifically at coffee consumption and bone mineral density. One shows higher tea scores. The other shows lower bone mineral density with more coffee. So I mentioned earlier that there was a relationship between caffeine consumption and potentially calcium. And this is an, another study that talks about this. So this is a review paper, but it talks about caffeine consumption historically has been inversely related with milk consumption. For whatever reason, people are going to consume more of one than the other. So usually when one goes down, the other goes up and vice versa. Caffeine is known to block calcium absorption, but not by very much. Observational studies also show that caffeine is a net negative for bone, but these have all been done in populations that may have lower than average calcium intake. So adequate calcium may be protective of the caffeine effect of bone. So again, another study saying, hmm, what about if you're getting adequate calcium, does this actually make a difference? And the answer is potentially. Now, here's another study that really digs into this calcium idea, which is that if we're getting adequate calcium, we don't necessarily need to worry about caffeine. And this is really, really important. So this is a 1994 study on 205 postmenopausal women. What it showed is that if you were getting adequate calcium, which they described as over 744 milligrams per day, the caffeine did not impact bone loss. In fact, those that were getting adequate calcium and consuming the same amount of caffeine had what appeared to be really protective um, effect of bone loss because the average bone loss in this age group, again, is around 1% per year. So if they were not losing that average of 1% per year, I would consider that actually a win. Although, of course, we'd love to see it build bone. But again, when it comes to taking away my caffeine and coffee, um, I'm going to take a neutral result. And that's exactly what this is for patients that are getting adequate calcium. All right. So, man, that's a lot of evidence around coffee, caffeine, and tea. But here's my take. You're not taking away my coffee. Now, I'm a fan of a caffeine detox annually, and I'm currently due for mine. But if you keep caffeine under 300 milligrams, which is a fair amount of coffee, and you get adequate calcium through diet or through whole food supplementation, then you're probably okay. You could consider tea over coffee if that suits you. I just can't get into tea, and that's okay. But you could consider tea over coffee if you really wanted to minimize this risk. Overall, I love coffee. And I'm aware that some coffee is potentially contaminated with mold and other toxins. And you might hear some famous influencers talk about that. There is a, a brand that I really like, though, that I have uh, an affiliation with. If you're interested, I can get you up to 40 percent off. So I personally use the coffee called Danger Coffee. That's why I was asking about people's favorite coffee at the, the beginning of this video. So I personally use Danger Coffee. Uh, I use both their whole bean and their ground form of coffee. And I can get you up to 40% off if you look for links in the description on YouTube. Um, it is third-party tested, clean, free of mold, and tastes fantastic. So consider that for what it is. This video was a review of coffee, tea, and caffeine. And if you like it, consider this one on what we got wrong about vitamin D. Really interesting look at that vitamin and what we've done to change that in our practice. And then our best calcium for osteoporosis, if you haven't read that one or seen that one yet or listened to it yet, I would strongly encourage you to do that. I'll see you in the next video.